All right, John Paul Mac Isaac, the infamous Delaware repair shop man, the one who came into contact with Hunter Biden's laptop. It's so great to meet you. I'm glad to have this conversation. I want to hear the story. Wow, where, where do you want me to begin? I'll tell you exactly where I want you to begin. I want you to begin in April of 2019 on a Friday night just before closing time. Well, yeah, it was about 10 minutes before closing, and uh, the I was definitely thinking about getting out of work. I was not thinking about spending time or staying late with uh, with anybody. And then the, uh, the countertop illuminated as the headlights of a car pulled up in front of the shop, and I kind of let out a sigh because I knew that my evening was going to be cut abruptly short or any plans that I had for that evening. And uh, then the client walked in the door with uh, three liquid damaged MacBook Pros. And I was able to check in one of them. Uh, the other one was a write-off. The other one I left uh, with the customer so he could take it with him and um, do the recovery himself. I, I was, when I saw the Bo Biden Foundation sticker and the customer informed me that he was Hunter Biden, uh, I, I instantly thought that this was his deceased brother's laptop and he wanted to get his memories off of it. So I decided that, you know what, I'm not gonna close. I'm gonna stay in the shop a little later. I'm gonna work with him, see if it's, I can help him out. And I felt bad for him. So he walks in, do you recognize him? I, I, I've read, by the way, John Paul, you're legally blind. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, when he walks in, at what point do you realize I'm dealing with Hunter Biden? Uh, when I asked him his last name. So the check-in process, I asked the customer his first name, and then I asked the last name. And w when he got to Hunter, uh, I wrote down Hunter, and then he, he goes, Biden, and kind of sarcastically, like uh, I should have known who he was. And, and I realized, oh, okay, kind of put two and two together, Bo Biden Foundation. I, I, you know what? I never really knew what he looked like. I never really cared. It was never in my inclination to, to pay attention to the Biden family or what they got up to. So I, I really didn't know who he was until he informed me of who he was. Well, I was going to ask you that. I think for a lot of people, unless you're incredibly politically active or politically read in, Hunter Biden isn't an A-list celebrity. The last name Biden is recognizable. Mm -hmm. So at the point that you realize, oh, this is a Biden, as in a political family of Bidens, um, did you know Hunter Biden's story? Did you know about his troubles? Did you know about his drug abuse? Did you know anything at that point? Mm, you, not really. I mean, you hear stories about, you know, the crazy Biden kids, uh, but that's about it. I mean, I, I was living in, in Biden's hometown. Uh, you know, the people that I hung out with went to school with, with Hunter and uh, with other members of the family. So. Uh, also, I know several people that have been not paid by the Biden family for various work that's been done over the decades. So it, it's, it's, we kind of knew what the family was about. We know their political family. We also know that sometimes they get into trouble. Sometimes they have a hard time paying their bills. So that's, that's based upon being in the Biden hometown. Your, mm -hmm. your, your depth of knowledge immediately is more than the casual news viewer, even maybe the, the well-read news viewer, because you're living in the town and there's reputations around mm -hmm. the family. What was the state of Hunter Biden when he came in that night? Um, he, he was definitely feeling no pain. Uh, he was intoxicated. Um, he had a, a little bit of a mobility issue. Um, speech was a little slurred. Uh, when I actually left the shop, probably about 45 minutes after he left the shop, uh, I noticed his vehicle was still there. I just assumed that he was sleeping one off because he was, yeah. So, okay, he walks into the shop at 10 minutes before closing time on a Friday night. In your estimation, he's inebriated. He is entitled to his reputation, meaning he already assumes you should know who he is as well. And he lays three water-damaged laptops on your counter. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you do then. Do you decide to stay late? You said you wanted to help him out. Does yeah. he stay with you? What's the process at that point in time? So I, I take a look at the first machine. It was a complete write-off. Apple solders the components to the logic board, so there's no way that I can recover data if I can't power on the machine. And the machine was just too far gone. So I just pushed that back to him. The uh, second machine just had some in inoperable keys. So I said, hey, look, here's a keyboard. You can use the keyboard to log in. That's when, unfortunately, he informed me of what his password was. And then I... Uh, what was that? Oh, I, I don't want to repeat that on the news. It was something inappropriate? It was, it was very inappropriate. Yeah. Um, 
So I gave him a keyboard so he could facilitate his own backup. Again, because I felt bad for this guy. He, I, I thought he was upset and he had been out on a bender because he was trying to reconcile with his dead brother's data that's on these computers. Uh, the third computer, there was a glimmer of life, but it would have required me to check it in so I could take it apart, disconnect some components to get the machine up and running. And I explained that process with him. I printed up an authorization allowing me to take custody of the machine. And I had him sign that document, review the document with him, and then uh, he left. And then I took the machine into the back and I started working on it. So, and for what it's worth for anybody watching that wants to know, by the way, his password, which is part of what is revealed in your book mm -hmm. uh, references, I think, two separate sex acts at the same time in one password. And he shares that with you. Um, and um, it's my understanding then, so does he take the first two laptops with him when he leaves and mm -hmm. leaves only one of the three with you in your custody? Correct. Okay, and so now you stay at the shop and you decide, I'm gonna go ahead and start mm -hmm. what? what? Start doing what to this computer? Well, he hired me to do the data recovery. So I booted up the machine, got the machine to a point where I could start to do a recovery. And uh, the condition of the machine didn't allow me to do a what's called a forensic copy. I had to literally just drag and drop folders. So I dragged the most important folder, dragged and dropped it to the server, and I said that's good enough for tonight, and I left. I came back the next morning to discover that the machine had died during the process. I only was able to recover about a third of the data, so I had to kind of go through and look at what I recovered compared to the original to see what made it over and what didn't, and that's when I realized that the person that a this is not his brother's laptop and that the person that's starring in a lot of this homemade porn is actually the guy that dropped off the laptop okay so, so during the data recovery process you you can see you begin to see what is on the files during the verification so when when uh, I went to go and copy data and then the, the machine shut down I don't know where it stopped it didn't complete the copy so I had to look at two lists of the data and then where something didn't match up, I'd click on it and then drag it to the folder so that the two lists would match up. It's in that process of clicking on a file, looking at the thumbnail, previewing the image. That's when I realized there was a considerable amount of pornography on this computer. Which I've heard you say, by the way, is par for the course in your business. Yeah, it's an occupational hazard. What, a lot of people have porn on their computer and a lot of people seem to damage their computer, so you see what's on a lot of people's computers? Um, it depends if it's if I'm hired to recover data or if somebody's having a problem with their data then I'm going to have to look at the data to perform that if somebody just needs the screen replaced on their on their laptop there's absolutely no reason to look at a customer's data at that point there's it's not the cause of the problem yeah I wanted to follow up with you on that because um, I think I've never taken a device to a repair shop so I can't speak from personal experience but I guess I might assume there's some expectation of privacy. Mm -hmm. Should Hunter have assumed some expectation of privacy at this point when it's in your custody? Did you break any ethical guidelines or anything by looking at his data? Uh, you, you know what? I don't think so. I know there's been a lot of people out there that, that question that. Um, he wanted me to recover his data. Uh, when, a, when a customer requires a data recovery, it's usually for two things movies and pictures. It's for the things that you can't replace. Um, you can always write a paper again, if it's a college paper. You can always re-download music that you've downloaded, or you can always read down Anything that you've downloaded, you can always replace. You can't go back in time and take a photograph or a, or a movie. Once you lose that data, that's irreplaceable. So when people come in for data recovery, that's what they want. That's what's irreplaceable. So. I have to go in and recover typically that type of data, pictures and video. And to make sure, I'm not gonna drag and drop a folder and then call a customer and say, hey, it's done, come on in, give me your credit card. I'm gonna make sure that I did the job correctly. And in that process, you have to verify the content that's on the computer. Uh, whether it's just quickly looking at it in a list view, or if it's in case of where there's a potential of data corruption, corruption manifests itself in video formats more than anything else because video is very intensive, audio is intensive. If there's corruption, it'll pop, it'll squeak, the video will get distorted. It'll manifest itself and you'll be able to see it. So when I opened up a video file that was rather large, that would have been a prime candidate for corruption if there was any corruption in the data transfer, 
that just so happened to be a homemade video of Hunter. So it, it's a homemade video of Hunter doing what? Well, amazingly, multiple illegal acts at the same time, but I don't want to go into detail. Multiple illegal acts? Are you talking yeah. about? Well, smoking crack and, um, I, you know, while engaged in sex trade. I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm not a lawman. I didn't. <laughs> so you're in your repair shop. This is the following day, I take mm -hmm. it. Um, you're starting to see what's on some of these files. Mm -hmm. You're seeing pornography. In your estimation, you're seeing illegal acts, drug use. What do you do next? I do the job. I mean, he, his dad's not running for president. This is just a guy. He wanted me to recover the data. I, I saw a couple financial documents that raised some red flags, but again, this is, it's none of my business and it's his gross stuff and I'm charging him way too little to do what I was doing. So I just wanted to get the job over and done with. And it really wasn't until two weeks later when his dad announced his candidacy that I started to get a fear for, okay, I've seen some very embarrassing material on this laptop. I'm pretty sure nobody's gonna want this embarrassing material out there or the knowledge of somebody that's seen it talking to anybody. So that's when I started to get more and more concerned for my personal safety because, and I think as we've all seen recently, the, the Secret Service is, is the Biden family fixer service. You know, they've bailed out Hunter whether it's pulling guns out of trash cans or it's waking him up when he's on a OD at a hotel it's, or using his dad's credit card. It's kind of, I expected the Secret Service to come into the shop to sweep that laptop under the carpet and take me along with them. But you said that's after two weeks of having the laptop when mm -hmm. his dad announces he's running for president. Mm -hmm. What happens in the interim? You've got the laptop for two weeks. Is the job done? Yeah, Do you I, try to get I finished the job uh, on, well, I called up Hunter, I believe it was the 16th, and, uh, or I think I called him up on the 15th and said, you need to go out to pick up a hard drive. He picked up a two terabyte, uh, I believe it was a two terabyte Western Digital. I think it was from Best Buy. Uh, he dropped that off on the 16th. I told him he could come in the next day to pick everything up. I transferred the data from the store server to the external overnight. I came in the morning the next day. Uh, transfer was complete. I called him. I sent him a square per his request, a, one of the square online request payment requests. Uh, filled that out, sent that in an email. Uh, I think I called him again the following weekend or right before the end of the month. I always call customers at the end of the month to collect on out of uh, uh, delinquent bills. Uh, and then uh, I think I called him a couple more times over the next month after that. So just no response. So you had multiple contacts with Hunter over the first couple of days of your introduction. You mm -hmm. tell him, come back. This is going to take a couple of days. Then you tell him, bring me a new external hard drive. And am I reading the situation right? You have pulled his data onto one of your servers, a mm -hmm. storage server that you own and maintain. Specifically for backup, yep. Specifically for backup. And then your plan is to then transfer the data mm -hmm. onto an external hard drive that he purchases. And yep. he does so. And he brings it to you? Mm -hmm. Yep. I say, now you've transferred the data onto his external hard drive. I assume at this point it's still on your server as well. Correct. And do you, as he, and he sort of disappears on you. So he disappears and never comes for that external hard drive that now maintains the mm -hmm. data? So now I'm in possession of his laptop, a backup of his laptop's home folder on an external drive that he provided, and no sign of Hunter. And the data as well and on your data. own server. Yeah. And Hunter never comes back. Mm -hmm. Have you heard from Hunter since that day? No, I, the closest I've heard to Hunter was on October 13th, so the day before the October uh, 14th New York Post story, uh, Hunter's lawyer calls me to see if, uh, I, I, if I was still in possession of the laptop. When is this? This was October 13th. Of? 2020, so the day before the New York Post. The day before the original New York Post story that was, mm -hmm. of course, censored on social media mm -hmm. and called Russian disinformation, you yeah. got a call from Hunter's attorney saying, do you in fact have the laptop? Yep, he actually said, uh, I think my client Hunter left the laptop with you sometime in 2017. Uh, do you still have it? So I actually told him what the FBI told me to say. If the FBI told me that if anybody comes looking for the laptop, you're to stall them. If they come in, just say, hey, it's in an offsite location, give me a day or two, I'll retrieve it and give you a ring, collect their information, pass that on to the FBI and the FBI would return the laptop.
three years later you get a call from Hunter's attorney, not mm -hmm. until the imminent drop of the New York Post story. All right, I want to rewind back though mm -hmm. to the three years prior. I'm still focusing on this period in time where you have his physical mm -hmm. property and his data. What have you, did you speak to an attorney in this time about custody? At some point, I assume when a customer no-shows you, mm -hmm. doesn't return your calls, doesn't come back for their property, what happens to their property? Does it become your property? Well, on the document that Hunter signed, it clearly states at the bottom, after 90 days, uh, the product becomes uh, my property. Um, at that point, I mean, there's, there's what's the saying? It's, uh, there's no um, assumption of um, privacy when it comes to things that you abandon. So I knew that this laptop became my property, and I, by then, and this was what, mid-July, it became my property, um, I, I knew that, that I needed this thing out of my shop. By then I had, uh, shortly thereafter it became my property, I took a look at some of the data because Burisma was in the news. Uh, I definitely saw some things that were a concern, an obscenely large amount of money being traded hands with Burisma in exchange for favors from the State Department. And, basically a pay for play scheme yeah. and I knew that between that and the embarrassing content that was on the laptop I needed to get this to the authorities if anything for my protection but if anything else that this was possible evidence in an, an investigation that needed to be attended to. And so what did you do? When is the first time you reached out to the authorities and who was that? So I was a little reluctant to approach the FBI in this neck of the woods. Um, I think Roger Stone had had his house raided at like the prior January, so I was really concerned and I think we've all seen the, the Russian collusion for three years. So I was concerned that the FBI was weaponized and I didn't trust anybody local. My father, who's a retired Air Force Colonel of 31 years, um, is, lives out in New Mexico. So I had a conversation with him and said, I, I voiced my concerns. And I was like, I want to get this to the authorities. I want to get it to the FBI because I feel like this is the proper channel. Uh, but I need to do it in Albuquerque. I can't, I can't do it myself. I'm too afraid to do it myself. Uh, so I enlisted my father to do it for me. Uh, so he approached the Albuquerque field office for the FBI in October, early October of 2019. Uh, which turned out to be probably, as he described it, the most humiliating experience of his life. Why is that? Uh, well, he's a 31-year colonel and, you know, gave 31 years of his life to the defense of this country and he walks into an office where the FBI agent basically tells him to lawyer up, get the hell out, and don't talk about this. Really? Yep. And this is, my dad was sitting there with a hard drive, a copy of the drives and paperwork saying, help protect my son. That's all my father wanted was to make sure that his son had some level of protection. This is the first r attempt to reach out mm -hmm. by either you or somebody on your behalf. Mm -hmm. You hadn't talked, contacted your own attorney yet. You hadn't done anything. Your first move is to go to the FBI, but the mm -hmm. FBI in Albuquerque through your father. Yep. And he's rebuffed. And yeah, he's basically, uh, this, this agent never gave him his name. Um, kind of questioned why my father was being cagey. Uh, when my father explained the situation in, in an effort uh, to, to attain some level of protection for me, uh, the FBI agent was like, well, we, you know, the, unless there's a criminal activity going on, we can't, and he goes, well, drug use and, and prostitution is a criminal activity. And the guy's like, you know, looked at the paperwork some more and then basically was like, like you, know, you need to get out of this office and you need to lawyer up and, and don't talk to anyone about this. What's the relationship between you and the FBI been like since that moment? Well, after, after the interaction in, at the, uh, in Albuquerque, uh, my father and I were just disenfranchised. We thought there was, you know, we didn't know what to do. Uh, it was an, a month later that an FBI agent named Joshua reaches out to my father in an effort to get a hold of me that we finally thought maybe somebody's gonna take this seriously. Uh, so the FBI met with me at my home 
and asked me about my concerns. I voiced my concerns. And they, I then shifted and said, hey, can, can I just want this out of my shop. At this point, just get it out of my shop and give me a phone number I can call should somebody come looking for it or wants to harass me about it. And they're like, yeah, we can't do that. We're going to talk to our legal team and see what we can do. And I'm like, ah, oh, dying here. It's just, I just want this over and done with. Uh, then they said they were going to come and they wanted to make a forensic clone of the drive. And I was like, well, that's going to be hard to do, but sure, whatever. You guys have the best tech guys in the world, so you know, let me know when you want to come in. And they agreed to come in on December 9th. Uh, when they showed up, instead of bringing a tech guy with them, they brought a subpoena. And they're like, yeah, we're just going to take everything. And I'm like, okay, great. Take it, take it all. This is exactly what I wanted in the first place. And uh, so I gave them the drive. I gave them the laptop. I gave them the paperwork. And, uh, and, and then they gave me a lot of things to sign. And I got my first subpoena. And, and then I, I don't know, I was a bit uncomfortable, a little nervous, but then excited at the same time. So I kind of cracked a joke. I said, uh, don't worry, lads. When I, when I write the book, I'll leave your names out of this. And that's when uh, Agent Mike turned around and said, oh, it's in our experience, nobody, nothing ever happens to people that talk about these things. And I was like, great. All right, well, they're taking it, so that's something. And then they told me that uh, should anybody come looking for it, you should uh, stall them, uh, tell them it's off-site, and then give us a call, and we'll return it. And then that threw up another red flag, because in my mind, this was going to be put in an evidence envelope and then sent to a lab somewhere outside of DC. So how could it be easily returned? So, and then a couple weeks after that, that was December 9th, I think a couple weeks after that, I got a call from Agent Mike who also said only communicate from that point on through text messaging with him only. He's the only agent that I'm allowed to talk to moving forward, but he's also the only agent that wasn't on any of the paperwork. So he's uh, kind of the bag man, I, I, I assumed. Uh, but he, he checked on me and I said nobody had come in to look for it. He seemed surprised. And then that was the last I heard of the FBI. This was when? What year? This you was said December, this of December of 2019. So I got to ask you, John Paul, if you wanted this, and you said your father reached out in October of 2019 mm -hmm. in Albuquerque, if you wanted this out of your possession so desperately, I believe it legally came into your possession as your mm -hmm. property in the summer of 2017. Well, Hunter's lawyer said my a customer dropped it, or Hunter dropped it off in 2017. He dropped it off in 2019. He, Hunter didn't even remember when he dropped it off. The, the Hunter's lawyer thought he dropped it off in 2017. Oh. So he, that's kind of, I was like, all right, this guy's all over the map. He, he doesn't remember. I see. So. so you held on to the laptop for a couple of months before mm -hmm. reaching out to the FBI. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, let's take a time out in this. I want to ask you a couple of non sequitur questions. First of all, oh. I asked you this in the, um, in the green room, and I think anybody that watches you probably has this question sitting at the top of their head. What is sitting atop your head? <laughs> <laughs> what is the hat? Uh, the, the hat generates liberal tears. <laughs> um, so I, it's a ball moral. It's like a beret with a pom-pom. It has my family's crest. I have a small collection of them, and I have an ugly head, and it's a good way to cover it. Plus, I, I'm visually impaired. Right. I walk into low-hanging branches, stop signs, uh, countertops. So it's nice to have some good, uh, like a bumper here to kind of <laughs> stop that from doing damage. Uh, I always wear the hat. I'm, I get sunburned. I'm an albino. So I get burned through brick walls if I'm not careful. Wow. And so I wear the hat a lot. When everything hit the fan in October 14 of 2020, uh, a lot of the hate mail that I was receiving, a lot of the death threats, a lot of the, the anti-pro-assumption Russian disinformation emails always seemed to kind of have a theme, that, a common theme, and, and that was, uh, you know, Putin thanks you for your service and your hat is stupid, or that hat is something ugly, and, and, it's, uh, and I got a kick out of that because it kind of told me, it gave me a little insight to these people that they cared more about the hat than about the truth. And then I realized that the hat's really triggering a lot of these people. And then I decided to, uh, why, why stop a good thing? And um, You've said several things there that I want to follow up mm -hmm. on. Um, I'm curious, just following the own curiosity about the legally bind, what, what, because it ties into what we originally talked about when Hunter walked into the shop of what you were able to see or ascertain in that moment. Um, what can you see? Can you, uh, can you see me well right now? Um, yeah, you're a white dude with a blue tie. <laughs> that's, uh, that's good. Yeah. Dark hair. 
I, I have an operational vision of about four to eight inches, so if I need to read, it's pretty much right up in front of me. After that, about four to eight feet, I can see enough to move around, unless, uh, like this morning, trying to get into this building was murder because it was all glass front. Uh, I walked up to what I thought was a door and I was searching for the handle and I couldn't find it and then I kept looking and then I watched a gentleman walk through a revolving door about 10 feet away from me and I was like that's it and then he looked at me weird too so you know I'm used to it. I'm well, I appreciate you making your way in this morning, and I really appreciate you sharing the story with us. I have many more things I want to talk about. I'm going to monitor our time here. Mm -hmm. um, so um, let me ask you this. Let's go directly to it because you did bring it up. Are you a Russian asset? Are you perpetuating <sighs> Russian disinformation? Yet, comrade. I mean, this is if this, the GSB is putting out things like this, then, then I don't think we have anything to worry about from Putin if this is uh, what they're training their agents to look like. Um, I just think it's the, the irony, like my, my family from the entirety that they've been in this country, okay, my grandfather came to this country, fought in World War II, fought in Korea, fought in Vietnam as a pilot in the Army Air Corps and the United States Air Force. My father fought during the latter part of the Cold War. So for the entire Cold War, there have been Mac Isaacs flying planes going after communists and to be accused of being one of those communists or even playing a part in that is just absurd to me now the 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 thing that bothers me about that because I, I i brush it off but everybody else thinks that i contributed or i worked with a foreign power to help affect the outcome of an election I mean, people associate that with traitorous activities, and I've been labeled a traitor because of that. And to have a family name that has served bravely and proudly in this country's military for so long, have that tagline traitor next to it is just, I'll, I'll fight like hell to prevent that from happening, I'll tell you that. I can understand, especially when what you're doing in many's estimation is an act of patriotism, sharing potential corruption, potential corruption that should be investigated within the United States government. Um, on that note of being called a traitor of, of trafficking in Russian disinformation, you have sued uh, Politico, mm -hmm. The Daily Beast, CNN, and Congressman Adam Schiff for, um, for sullying your good name, mm -hmm. for slander. Tell me about that lawsuit. Well, I went after Twitter originally because they labeled me a hacker. And if I was ever gonna be any, start up any kind of computer repair business again, uh, having the, the title hacker is more, to me at that time, more devastating than being labeled a Russian asset, which was just ridiculous. Uh, so I went after Twitter and tr they switched judges with an Obama appointed judge and the, she threw the case out with prejudice and awarded Twitter the Florida sta slap statue. So I was basically wiped off the map. I was yeah, you're destroyed. Right. The original accusation was that it was hacked material. Yeah, Twitter's accusation. Twitter didn't say I was a Russian. Twitter said that it was hacked material, ergo I was a hacker. Whereas Hunter gave me his password. Usually hackers don't get the privilege of having the owner give them their password. That's not hacking at that point. That's just accessing. So it's, it was ridiculous, but it, it had a, as a, on a career standpoint, being labeled a hacker is a death sentence. Um, Twitter wanted to make an example out of me, so they punished me in the courts and financially, and I, I never thought I would have an opportunity to defend my actions or hold those accountable again. Uh, that's one reason why I, I sat down and I wrote my book, because I, I knew that in the court of law, I was destroyed, but maybe I still had a chance in the court of public opinion. Uh, turns out that about a month ago, the, uh, Joe Flynn, uh, General Flynn's uh, brother uh, from the America Project, uh, approached my attorney and wanted to uh, fund our lawsuits. So uh, I now have a second chance to hold these people accountable, and I'm, I'm going to fight like hell to do it. In any type of defamation suit, you have to prove damages, and you have paid a price, right? Yeah, I lost my business. I was forced out of my state for about a year. Um, I, I've been singled out by the IRS. Uh, I was denied unemployment. Um, Is that right? Yeah. Um, so you lost your business. Mm -hmm. well, how were you forced out of your state? Uh, I was getting too many death threats. It was, it was, um, the, 
it was no longer safe for me to be in Delaware. You've been audited by the IRS? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they looked back, uh, they found $58 last September, $58 from 2016. So I guess I've been okay on my taxes, but. And you've been denied unemployment? Yep, I was denied unemployment for a year, even though my business paid into unemployment for 10 years, and this was exactly what unemployment was there for. I started applying for it in December of 2020. And uh, I, it took me writing a letter to Chris Coons saying I would hate to see a state agency politically motivated like this, so can you please tell me what's going on? Magically, a couple days later, I got a phone call and then I started getting checks, but not, not all, the, all of it, but it was enough to keep me going. But you shouldn't have to do that. John Paul, what do you think about the institutions of the United States government? I would imagine you have a perspective now that is informed by some of the stuff that you saw on the laptop, but also now the experience that you've endured in the wake of exposing what was on the laptop. You have just labeled or told me that numerous government institutions, from state unemployment offices to the IRS to the FBI, have all taken, let's put it this way, a very clear position mm -hmm. when it comes to you. Yeah. What do you think of the institutions of the United States of America? Well, call it, call it a na naive repairman's point of view, but I think that sometimes you gotta let things fail before you can have the opportunity to fix them. And I think that this is a case for that. Uh, I believe in the FBI. I didn't trust the FBI. The FBI's broken. They demonstrate that. But I still believe that the system is there for a purpose and it's the right course of action. It was the right decision. I didn't want to go to the press. I didn't want to go to the media because I didn't feel like that was what had to be done. That wasn't the proper channel. If the FBI had done their job, I would have still had my business. I know the world would never have known I existed if the FBI had done their job right. So, you know, obviously I have a bone to pick with them, but I don't think it needs to be replaced. I don't think it needs to be torn down or destroyed. I just think it's broken and it needs to be fixed. Is it limited? Is your indictment of broken institutions limited to the FBI? Well, I mean, the DOJ on a bigger picture, um, you know, they, they obviously have some explaining to do. Um, you know, I, I went to Cong or I did not go to Congress. So when the impeachment happened, when the impeachment trial went down, I was still had my fingers crossed that the FBI was gonna admit the laptop as evidence so the White House had some, had it for defense. Uh, my heart sank when the impeachment trial concluded and there was no sign of that laptop anywhere because I had definitely seen stuff on that laptop that would have justified a phone call to Zelensky saying what happened in, during the former administration because there was a lot of money exchanging hands, there's a lot of uh, pay for play and a lot of the same players back then are the same players now. And so it kind of begs the question that there's a lot of money pouring into Ukraine once again and the Bidens got really rich last time this happened. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, that when the FBI didn't enact, I felt like the next thing to do was to go to Congress, except I was still afraid of my identity being leaked. And so I kind of, again, enlisted my father and my uncle to go to Congress. But the past three years of Russian collusion and the Mueller report had put up uh, this Patrical guard around all these senators that we were and congressmen that we were reaching out to to try to get a hold of them and they were so afraid of being wrapped up in some more Russian collusion or another conspiracy theory that we uh, my, our cries for help fell on deaf ears. So you went to I would assume Republican members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With your story. Yeah. And you were rebuffed. My uncle and my father, both retired colonels, both approached several members of Congress and and were rebuffed. You want to share with us who those members of Congress were? I don't. I, I, I know why they did it, and I understand, and I get it. Um, and recently, I've reached out to a lot of the same members personally, and, and this is where I fault myself. If I had, I knew the names. I had looked at the data. I had an intimate understanding of what had happened in Ukraine at that time, and I knew dates, I knew players, I knew events. And if I had taken that information and I had approached these individuals, I think with that level of clarity, that would have been a lot more believable. And I think I could have done more 
at that time. But because I was afraid of getting outed and having my identity known and, trying, and I was trying desperately to protect my identity and my business, uh, I relied on other people to do that for me. So I, that's where I failed. It's not their fault, it's mine. Okay, so you're telling us that during the impeachment of President Donald Trump, there are questions obviously that he raised about the propriety of businesses in Ukraine, and specifically when it comes to Burisma, as you mentioned. At this point, you're well read in. You've looked at the documents on the, on the laptop. You know there's relevance to what you found directly to the relevance of the impeachment of Donald Trump. Beyond that, corruption of what would then become the president of the United States, potential corruption that at the very least needs to be investigated. You see it's not happening. Mm -hmm. you're, apparently, you now become aware the FBI is not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. You go to Congress, you get pushed back, or you don't receive a warm welcome. Your father um, mm -hmm. doesn't receive a warm welcome from Republican members of Congress. And I hear you, you take ownership of maybe it wasn't sold or pitched or, mm -hmm. or communicated in the best way. Which, I could have done more. Which you could have done more. What do you do next then? Carry me forward in the timeline because at some point mm -hmm. I become aware. Yeah. The people watching become aware. Your next move is, an, is, a, is a move that, that brings this story to all of us. Well, it was, it was the end of August. Um, and I, I knew the clock, August of 2020, I knew the clock was ticking and I finally had enough. And I just basically decided to trade my fear for courage, step out from the shadows and, and uh, I guess, I guess to backtrack a little bit, so before I went to the FBI, or had my father go to the FBI, I made two copies of the drive. I made a copy to give to my father so he could give it to the FBI. I made another copy to give to a friend of mine. Should something happen to me, that drive would have been mailed to Rudy Giuliani. Time out very quickly, mm -hmm. because you mentioned to me that the FBI at some point in time also came to you and took the laptop. Yeah. And I assume that external hard drive that Hunter had given to you as well. Yes. But you still had on your backup server, which we discussed earlier, mm -hmm. you still had the data on that backup server. Yes. So that's the source of these copies you're making. Uh, it's, it's three years ago. I believe so. I, I, yeah. Uh, so the FBI took it. This is before the FBI was even engaged. I didn't trust the FBI enough to make a copy of the drive and just put it off site. That way, if I disappeared, if the FBI threw me in a hole somewhere, then my friend would hand deliver this drive to Rudy Giuliani. The reason why Rudy Giuliani is because during the summer of 2019, he was in the Ukraine researching exactly what I was sitting on. So I was kind of keeping a finger on the pulse of what his activities were. And I knew that he was a lawyer and he had probably knew more about what the Bidens were up to in the Ukraine than any other person on the planet besides Hunter. You chose Rudy Giuliani. I chose Rudy as to be my, my safety net. Should something happen to me, my friend would reach out with a copy of the drive. Fast forward a year, and now we're in August of 2022, I decide to reach out to Rudy Giuliani's office directly. I get in contact with Bob Costello. Two or, day, two or three days, days later, I overnight that very same drive that I was gonna be my safety net, I use that drive to mail to Rudy Giuliani's uh, lawyer, Bob Costello, overnight on August 28th of 2020. Okay, and then, and then Rudy starts revealing some of the information, mm -hmm. and immediately now, it's Russian disinformation. Yep, so it, it was scary, because at 6.30, I didn't go to sleep that night. After I received a phone call from Hunter's lawyer, I was, uh, I was really nervous, and I did not sleep well at all. And I didn't even go home. Uh, I just stayed at a friend's house. And then, so I'm looking at the news, and the article came out at 6.30 in the morning, and by 9.30, it was like this digital iron curtain had descended and nobody was allowed to talk about it. Nobody could tweet it or send uh, even private message in Twitter, uh, any discussion. The New York Post account was blocked. Facebook was blocking it. And then it started happening, Russian disinformation, Russian disinformation. And it was like this coordinated effort by mainstream and social media all at the same time. Like, this is not something that you, some guy picks up, hey, I saw this on the news, go tell this guy, go tell this guy. This all happened at the same time, which told me they were waiting for it. They were ready. And it was in the FBI's possession for quite some time, so there was, this didn't come as a surprise, to your mm -hmm. point of ready and waiting for it. And by the way, it was rejected by the intelligence community mm -hmm. very yeah. quickly. Yep. So what does that tell you? What, what does that tell you that your life experience, your story, was met with 
a hard, I don't know what the right verb is, pushback, a hard, as you mentioned, iron curtain, whatever it may be, a hard door being slammed in your face, and not, but that's still underplaying it because you were also, to your point, defamed by major media institutions, the spy agencies of the United States of America, the law enforcement agencies of the United States of America, every single major apparatus, mm -hmm. almost at the same time, focused on you and branding you as Russian disinformation. What does that tell you? It's, it told me that they were, wait, they were waiting for it. And I think Zuckerberg said it best in the Senate hearing, I believe on October 25th, uh, he let Congress know that he was approached as well as Twitter and Google were approached by the FBI in I believe early September to warn them that there would be a massive dump of foreign intelligence pertaining to a presidential candidate be on the lookout so if the FBI warned in early September social media to be on the lookout and I overnighted the copy of the drive on August 28th who was being tapped was it the FBI did they have a FISA court open for me or were they monitoring the lawyer for the president of the United States it's just kind of the timings really off it's like they had the whole year to that they were in possession of it that they were waiting for something to happen, and then I decide to do something, and then they immediately warn, and then they, it's, the collusion aspect is, is obscene. Uh, that, that level of federal and, and social media that we rely on every day, tr news media that we trust every day, and a government that we're supposed to put our faith in, it's, it's just they all decided to go with the Russian narrative because it worked last time, it's been working for them great for the last four or five years, so why not? They just, unfortunately, it was a real story with real consequences. And what do you think those consequences were? Well, for me, uh, you know, obviously I lost my business and I lost my place in my community. I don't feel safe moving around. And, uh, but for the nation, it's, it's, I hope it'll let us aware that there's, that for all those people that are afraid that we are moving towards socialism, we already have a state-run media. We already have state-run social media, and they, that machine went into operation on August, or October 14th, 2020, to affect the outcome of an election, to protect their preferred presidential candidate. And my life was ruined in that process, but the nation is suffering. And that's what I'm hoping the lawsuit will discover is who gave those marching orders? Who told the 51 int pillars of our intelligence community to pen a letter that this was all Russian collusion? Who told everybody that this was Russian? Because I want to find out so that never, hap that never happens again. The book is American Injustice. Mm -hmm. We can hear your whole story, read your whole story. In that book, go pick it up wherever you buy your books. And I really appreciate you sharing this story in depth and in detail with the amount of time you've given with me here today. I really well, appreciate thanks. it. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right. John Paul Mac Isaac. Thanks, man. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you.